Welcome to the third uh, talk of the morning session. Uh, this talk will be given by Peter Shaw, who's following your Val's talk from yesterday is about PCGs, are going to show more advanced instructions. Please, Peter. Thank you, Commit. Uh, yes, so I guess by now you've already seen quite a bit on vector overlay and PCGs over the last few days. Um, so you, you've all gave this very nice survey of the general area of various different constructions. Uh, so what I'm going to do today in this talk and the next one is dig a bit deeper into some of these. Uh, yeah. Um, so firstly, in this talk, I'll be diving into the PCGs from LPN for oblivious transfer and vector OLE, getting into some of the details and the protocols involved, looking at performance numbers. And then for the next talk afterwards, I'll be looking at these PCF constructions, which you all briefly mentioned from number theoretic assumptions. Okay, so for the outline of this talk, um, I'm actually going to start by having a quick recap of a, the kind of classical approach to doing OT extension in this non-silent way, um, predating PCGs, uh, because I think it's kind of relevant to understand and put in context for the more modern constructions, and it works in a slightly different way. So it's, I think, interesting to see the differences and, and perhaps use that as inspiration for future ideas. And then building on that, I'll present the silent OT construction, which Yuval gave yesterday in a slightly different manner, um, in a little more detail, and giving it in some kind of somewhat general framework as to how we can build these PCG type things, um, which again is giving you the hope of um, you know, understanding things in a different light and perhaps leading to different constructions one day in the future. <clears throat> Then we'll be looking at the setup protocol for generating the PCG seeds and how we achieve active security there and concluding with some open problems as usual. Okay, so I guess you've seen this slide quite a few times by now. Uh, so I won't go into the details because the motivation is MPC and this pre-processing model. And what we don't want to do is replace this expensive pre-processing phase with this much shorter setup phase, which just distributes a pair of short correlated seeds to the parties which they can then silently expand in this silent pre-processing phase to get all of the correlated randomness they need for the online phase of the protocol. And eventually this trusted setup functionality which distributes the seeds will be replaced by some small setup protocol, which again has low communication. Okay, and then formally, just to remind you of the definition, um, so PCG is tied to a specific kind of correlation which we want to generate. Uh, given to here the two parties. And to do this, we have a pair of algorithms, the key generation algorithm, which just distributes the two PCG seeds, and then the expansion algorithm, which takes one of the seeds and outputs some correlated randomness. And the main security property we want from this is this notion of security against insider attacks, where if an adversary is given one of the keys, say here K0, then the other party's output, R1, coming from an expand, should be indistinguishable from a freshly sampled output from the correlation conditioned on coming from the distribution, which have the same set of R0s coming from key K0. And this is enough to get you know, the right kind of indistinguishability we need for secure protocols and can be plugged directly into many MPC protocols in the preprocessing model, for instance. Okay, so I'm going to focus on oblivious transfer in today's talk. Um, pretty much everything I'll talk about also applies to vector OLE. I'll sometimes mention the differences, um, but OT is a little bit simpler and easy, just easy to see. Um, so the OT functionality is represented by this ideal box, this trusted party, which takes uh, the two parties' private inputs. So Alice has a choice bit B, um, Bob has two strings, and Alice wants to get one of these strings while Bob does not learn which, uh, string she, which string she received and Alice doesn't learn anything about the other one, of course. So classically, we know that OT requires public key cryptography to build. And this is the kind of main drawback of standard OT constructions is that the, you know, this is very expensive, especially in situations where you want to do a lot of OTs. So the kind of thing to imagine is maybe a complex secure computation of a very large circuit where we might need millions and millions of OTs. 
Uh, so the idea of OT extension generally is to minimize this reliance on costly public key operations and shift this to maybe a one-time or small setup phase while the rest of the OT extension can be carried out only using cheap symmetric cryptography. Okay, and a related notion is a variant of OT called correlated OT, uh, <coughs> which is uh, defined for a batch of OTs. So here we have M OTs, um, where Bob is the sender, but this time, instead of choosing his strings independently, every pair of strings in the ith OT now has this correlation where the XOR to give this fixed difference delta. And this can also be seen as a kind of vector OLE, so this subfield vector OLE, which I also mentioned in the talk on Sunday, uh, and it's also equivalent to an information theoretic MAC of F2. So if you look at the receiver's output, then this is just um, SI plus it's bit BI multiplied by uh, the fixed offset delta, which is now chosen to be a lambda bit string for security parameter lambda. <coughs> Okay, so correlated OT is useful because it's essentially all we need to build OT. Um, it's got a kind of simpler structure with this fixed correlation, uh, which makes it easier to build. And if you want to use this to get a general OT, then you can directly turn this correlated OT into random OT, non-interactively using a hash function. So Bob will just take his uh, pair of strings, so SI, SI XOR with delta, put these through a hash function, this kind of breaks the correlation to find these two independent and random looking messages. And likewise, Alice can hash her output string yi and get one of Bob's two new strings. And if the original inputs to the correlated OT were random, then the security property of this hash function, if it's, um, as long as it satisfies this kind of pseudo random correlation robust property, uh, then the resulting random OT strings will be pseudo random. And of course, once we have random OT, we can use that for our MPC with pre-processing and convert it to a chosen input OT in the online phase, for instance. Okay, so let's move on to the classic IKNP OT extension protocol, uh, going back to 2003. Um, <clears throat> so this construction, it's, it's very simple and elegant. It relies on a nice uh, symmetric property of correlated to OT. Um, basically, has three steps I like to think of as a correlate, transpose, and hash. Uh, so, <clears throat> first off, we start by creating a batch of correlated OTs. Um, <clears throat> so, here is kind of visually represented just a single correlated OT on a very long bit string. Um, so, Bob has a string S, uh, which now is going to be very long, and S plus delta, where again, delta is a very long bit string. And uh, we'll create a batch of these, uh, roughly security parameter of these, and put them all into the rows of a matrix. Um, so now Bob has these two matrices, and Alice has a single matrix where each row is one row from one of Bob's two matrices. Okay, so this is the correlate phase uh, where we set up these initial batch of very long correlated OTs. And now in the transpose phase, we essentially want to transpose these matrices. So Let's look at Alice's um, outputs here. Um, so we have this YI matrix. And if we transpose it, we just turn it on its side, right? Um, <clears throat> so maybe that's not so helpful. If we uh, rename things a little bit, then uh, we can look at this more clearly. Um, so instead of looking at the columns of the matrix, we're now going to look at the rows, which were the columns of the previous matrix in the, uh, indexed by superscripts here. And we look at this right-hand part especially. So each column was this choice bit B multiplied by this fixed offset delta. Then if we look at the rows, then that's actually equivalent to having a single bit of delta multiplied by this entire string B of Alice's choice bits. So this has uh, kind of given us this symmetric property compared with what we started with on the left. So if we now think of the deltas as choice bits, then we have a new set of correlated OTs where the roles of the sender and receiver have actually been reversed. So we started off with, remember, this small batch of K OTs on very long strings, which means now by transposing, we've converted this into a large batch of MOTs 
on only k-bit strings. And then the key here is that if um, Alice chose her choice bits B to be uniformly random in the first place, then this can kind of take the place of the delta in a correlated OT, and we can directly apply the hash function to the transpose OTs to get a large batch of random OTs. So that's IKMP in a nutshell. Um, <clears throat> now, if you think about the efficiency of this, so this is transposing and hashing, this is just a completely non-interactive, a small amount of local computation. So the only part of this, which is non-silent, is creating these correlated OTs in the first place. Um, essentially, the communication is proportional to the length and the number of OTs. And for security parameter 128, you need 128 bits for each OT you want to output in the end. And this is what we want to avoid, of course. So for comparison, if you look at silent OT extension, uh, I kind of think of this as being very similar steps, but now following a slightly different paradigm where we correlate, expand, and hash. So note that we're not going to do any transposition. So the roles of the two parties throughout the protocol will always stay as receiver and sender. And this correlate phase will of course have to be different because we don't want to communicate and send all of these bits to set up the OTs. So there'll be a kind of special kind of smaller correlation that is set up to allow this silent expansion in the second phase. And the last part of the hashing is identical in both. So all we want to do is generate correlated OTs. <clears throat> okay, so the rough goal then is just to take this set of correlated OTs we start with. Um, this time, they're not going to be on very long strings. They're just going to be you know, the, the string length we want, and we only start with a few of them because we want to somehow magically expand these into a very large batch of correlated OTs where the new receiver bits are pseudo-random. So obviously, we need to apply some kind of cryptography here, right? We started with something small, expanded it to something large. So a natural thing to think about is, OK, what if we have a, a pseudo-random generator, which satisfies some special homomorphic property, which might preserve this correlation? Okay, So suppose as a PRG, which is linear, so g of s plus t is g of s plus g of t. Or here we want the addition of the outputs to be XOR, um, since we're working on bit strings. And then this actually works out. So the receiver can just take its bit strings B and expand them using a PRG to get a long vector of pseudo-random bits. And then the strings of the OT, these strings S, I, Y, I, can be expanded in exactly the same way using a PRG. And the linearity means that we preserve the OT relation throughout this process. However, there is a slight problem with this process, which is that this kind of PRG does not exist. If you have any PRG which satisfies this completely linear relation on its outputs, then G will not be secure. You can easily break this using linear algebra. So we need to look for some kind of alternative. Uh, now, one possibility I'll quickly mention is that you can build PRGs from lattice-based assumptions like LWE and ring LWE, uh, which are not quite homomorphic, but they satisfy this almost additive homomorphic property with some small probability of error. Um, and you can kind of make this work and get something which is not really the silent OT you want, but it's a, a kind of weaker flavor of the same type of thing, uh, which I looked at in this paper from PKC a few years back. Uh, but it's not really very practical. Um, it didn't seem to work out so great. Um, so the right kind of PRG to use here actually seems to be to take a different assumption, which is where learning parity with noise comes in. OK, so what is this LPN assumption? Um, <clears throat> so we work out some modulus P, which uh, can be two or can be larger. Uh, we have a public matrix A multiply it by a secret S, and then add some random noise vector. The idea is that this should, by adding this noise, we should make this somehow indistinguishable from the uniform distribution, um, because it's hard to recover the secret of noise given this noisy encoding of S. 
Okay, but this actually also looks very similar to LWE, right? So with LWE, okay, normally we work with larger modulus, not just uh, p equals two. Um, we have the secret S sampled uniformly uh, over ZP. In LWE, this noise vector is usually chosen to be small relative to the side of P. So it's you know, often some Gaussian distribution where each coordinate is fairly small. And that's what gives us the pseudo randomness. So the only difference in LPN is the noise distribution, essentially. So instead of choosing E from some Gaussian distribution, we choose it to have a small Hamming weight. So we can either you know, independently choose each coordinate from, say, the Bernoulli distribution for working mod two with some small error probability, or we can even fix the number of non-zero coordinates and then sample it uniformly subject to this. <clears throat> okay, so and uh, yeah, so it turns out changing this error distribution just in this small way actually greatly changes the types of things you can build from this. So for instance, LWE, we can build fully homomorphic encryption. With LPN, we don't even know how to build additively homomorphic encryption. But on the other hand, this nice structure of the noise for LPN actually seems to make it much easier to work with uh, for MPC type, type applications, as we see here. Okay, so from LPN, obviously we can't build linear PRGs, but we can build these PRGs, which have this kind of almost linear property. So if, if you view the PRG seed as a seed having a special structure, so first this random secret S, and then this uh, sparse noise vector E, which obviously is a very long vector, but has low entropy, at least low entropy than the output, then applying this linear transformation by multiplying S times A and adding the noise gives us something pseudo-random. And there's another construction called the dual construction uh, where we don't have a secret S. We just take the noise vector and then multiply that by a very long compressing matrix. And by compressing the noise with the right kind of matrix here, we can actually get something pseudo-random. Um, and for H, which is chosen in a way related to the original A from LPN, this is equivalent to the same assumption. So both of these are secure PRGs under LPN. And of course, now we have this nice linear evaluation as long as we start with this error vector E as our input. So a quick note about the um, properties of these two constructions. So in the primal construction, um, because of the way you have to choose the parameters um, based on known attacks, we're limited to a quadratic stretch. Um, in terms of the entropy we end up with compared with what we started with. Whereas the dual construction, we don't have this secret anymore. And it turns out we can actually just increase the output length by scaling up the dimensions of the matrix. And we don't need to increase the noise weight of E proportionally. So the best known attack is essentially independent of the dimension and just scales with uh, the number of non-zero coordinates in the error vector E. So this is we get an arbitrary polynomial stretch in this PRG, and so it tends to lead to better communication, but it's harder to implement because we have this very big matrix multiplication, which is uh, much heavier to do computationally compared with the one in the primal construction. Okay, so how do we exploit this sparse noise uh, from LPM to build the PCGs? So as, as you saw in your VAS talk, um, <clears throat> the goal is to compress secret shares of some sparse vector. So here we can think of this as the correlated OT phase for the OT extension. Right. E is now going to be some sparse vector chosen by the receiver. Think of it as some initial sparse choice bits. And then delta is the sender's correlation in the correlated OT. Uh, we want to uniformly expand this when we're given secret shares. So we can give out the secret shares in some special compressed way. Um, then we can expand these to get large shares of the product and then apply the linear transformation from LPN to get pseudo-random correlated OTs. So that's the essence of the LPN-based OT extension. Um, obviously, the, the main ingredient here that we need is to actually create these shares 
of the sparse vector. <clears throat> and we're going to do that using puncturable pseudorandom functions. Uh, so while Elette talked a lot about function secret sharing, and um, we've mentioned that we can use this to compress sparse vectors, for this case of silent OT, uh, this is actually overkill. And you can get away with this simpler object of a punctual p punctual PRF, which um, makes the constructions, I think, easier to understand and also easier to implement. <clears throat> so punctual PRF is a, a standard pseudorandom function with a key generation algorithm, which allows evaluating the function on all inputs, as well as a special punctured key generation algorithm, which produces a, a punctured key programmed to be punctured as, at a specific point alpha. Uh, and given the punctured key, you can evaluate the function at all points in the domain, except for the point alpha. And for security, we require that when you're given this punctured key and alpha, then the missing evaluation, fk at alpha, is pseudorandom. OK, and there's a very simple construction. Uh, going back to the GGM-based construction of a PRF from a PRG based on a binary tree, um, where the punctured keys essentially have this logarithmic blow up in size, uh, where n is the size of the domain of the PRF. So given a punctual PRF, uh, we can share a sparse vector by first giving out a PRF key k to the sender, just chosen randomly, and then giving the receiver this special punctured key, uh, punctured at a point alpha, where alpha is going to correspond to the um, say a non-zero coordinate in a vector we're sharing. I suppose we're just sharing a noise vector with weight one. Okay, so then by just applying the PRF evaluation at every point in the domain, the sender obtains a pseudorandom vector of length n, while the receiver obtains the same vector, just missing this one evaluation, the position alpha, which it can't compute. So if we just X all these things together, then we actually have shares of a sparse vector already, right? Um, <clears throat> so at position alpha, we're going to get this pseudo random value not known to the receiver. And the rest everywhere else, this, these vectors are shares of zero. So the only thing we're missing here is, okay, this kind of noise value at position alpha in the vector is this pseudo random output of the PRF. Um, so perhaps we also want to tweak this so that we can multiply this uh, value delta, which is known to the sender. And this can be done easily by just giving out a correction value. So the receiver will also get from the setup phase, um, fk of alpha mass with delta, and then can adjust its shares accordingly so that we end up with delta multiplied by a sparse vector. Okay, so I think this is a very simple and natural approach for doing this from punctual PRFs. And the sender just has to store a single key, which can be 128 bits. And the receiver has this punctured key, which has this log n overhead, but it's still only lambda times log n bits when we're expanding this to produce an n bit vector. So this is an exponential compression from the original length of the vector. <clears throat> Okay, but this only gets us a single weight one vector, whereas what we want to use LPN is sparse vectors with many non-zero coordinates, say um, T, where T is related to the security parameter. Of course, the natural way you can do this is just by taking T of these weight one vectors and then adding them up after expanding the shares. Uh, but then you incur this factor T overhead in the computational cost of expansion, as well as the seed size. Um, this can be approved by using cuckoo hashing, and you can make this computation actually linear, uh, but it's kind of expensive to implement and add some, yeah, add some overheads, which would be nice to avoid. So a different method, which I think is generally more preferred in practice, is to have a more structured error vector. Um, so we can divide this error vector into fixed blocks, where each block has only a single non-zero coordinate. And then we can just use a batch of um, weight one vectors of a shorter length and concatenate them. And this gives us the optimal evaluation if each punctual PRF can be evaluated in linear time. So we get linear complexity overall for the entire weight T vector. <clears throat> of course, the downside of this approach is that 
this regular error pattern gives us a slightly different assumption compared with standard LPN, um, which we may have to account for when choosing parameters. Okay, so there was one thing I haven't talked about much in, um, in the silent OT construction so far, which is how we actually plug in the LPN assumption. Um, <clears throat> so of course we use punctual PRF to share these sparse vectors. And then in the primal case, we also need to share this secret key times by delta. Uh, remember S is now some uniform vector, but of a smaller size. And this we can just do using correlated OT in the standard way. So that's fine. And once, once we have these, um, we can apply the linear LPN function to get our pseudorandom correlated OTs. <clears throat> and the question is, okay, which matrix do we choose? Do we want the primal one? Do we want the dual one? Uh, there's, there's a lot of different choices here. So one thing you don't want to do is just choose a uniformly random matrix. Because uh, then based on the number of OTs we want, we have millions of um, outputs eventually, uh, then this matrix multiplication is totally impractical. So with the primal approach, one thing you can do is just choose this matrix A to be sparse. Um, so for instance, it's common to choose it so that each row has only, say, a constant number of non-zero coordinates, maybe 10 in practice. Uh, so then you get a linear complexity of doing this matrix multiplication. And the security of this goes back to a, an assumption uh, which was introduced by Leknovich in 2003, used for public key encryption. And, uh, well, I'm, I'm not sure it's been used a lot in practice, apart from with the silent OT constructions, but at least it's been around a while, uh, and there don't seem to be any significant attacks. <clears throat> uh, so another option, if you want the dual paradigm, where you can get away with this much better stretch, uh, kind of in terms of the seed size, uh, and this is more complex to implement, uh, but one option is to use a structured matrix with this quasi-cyclic structure, where essentially multiplying by this matrix corresponds to a polynomial multiplication, so it can be done in quasi-linear time. And this is actually the same assumption that's used in a couple of the candidates that were in the NIST competition for code-based public key encryption schemes. So it's seen a fair bit of analysis in the last few years and some attention from cryptanalysts. <clears throat> but obviously with this logarithmic factor overhead makes it more expensive computationally than the primal candidate. <clears throat> and more recently, there was this paper last year from Crypto, which looked at a different approach to instan instantiating dual LPN, uh, where they define this matrix H based on the transpose of a generator matrix of a, a very structured LDPC code. Um, I won't say any more about since I'm not sure enough about the details myself. Uh, but this manages to get the, the multiplication time to be linear complexity. Um, so improves greatly uh, in terms of computation across the previous approaches. And there is some analysis of security in this, but it's this new type of assumption which hasn't seen much study. Um, so it would be nice if some more people looked at this. And then finally, there's another variant I want to mention, which actually isn't relevant for OT and vector only, because it's essentially introducing more structure into the matrix um, and put more possible types of algebraic attacks. Uh, but the idea here is, is that <clears throat> when we want to do OLE or multiplication triples in this silent way, uh, then it's nice to have some multiplicative structure, which we can get by relying on LPN over polynomial rings. Um, this is exactly the same kind of rings used in ring LWE. Um, so this is basically ring LWE with the sparse noise instead of Gaussian noise. Um, so it introduces some attacks you have to be careful of, but if you account for them, then you can still use this efficiently and it seems to work out well. Um, again, it's just a new assumption from last year or so. Uh, so it'd be nice if people took a look at this and studied it further. But this is something you don't need if you just want OT or vector only. Okay, so that was the PCG part of the talk. Uh, now I'm going to move on to the setup protocol for actually generating these seeds in the first place. Um, so we can do this without having to rely on a trusted dealer. And for this, we of course need to dive into the details of this punchable PRF. Uh, so this is the GGM construction. 
um, which can be used to build a punctual PRF, where the sender has this random key K, which is then used to build this binary tree. So at each node of the binary tree is assigned with some key K. We're starting at the root. We expand K using a pseudo-random generator to obtain two new keys. And then do this recursively until we end up with N keys at the leaves, where each leaf corresponds to a single output of the pseudo-random function. <clears throat> but having this tree-like structure lends itself very nicely to puncturing. So we want to puncture at this point alpha, um, corresponding to the leaf node in position alpha, then we can just give to the receiver all of the nodes which are children of a node on the path from the root towards alpha. So in this case, it's these three yellow nodes. We send these over to the receiver. Then the receiver can apply the corresponding evaluation by just obtaining the subtrees for each of its node. And we see that it then obtains all but one of the evaluations of the PRF, uh, where it's missing exactly the point at alpha for its private index. OK, so we want to build a setup protocol, which will allow us to generate this punctual PRF key uh, in a way that the sender doesn't learn alpha, while the receiver doesn't learn anything about the sender's key um, or the missing evaluation. <coughs> so the way to think about this is in some recursive manner. So let's suppose the receiver's already got um, these yellow correction values for, say, the first two levels of the tree. Um, we want to do this and now get the correction value for the next level. <clears throat> so this is one of these two leaves um, in which are missing here. In this case, we want the one on the right because the one on the left corresponds to alpha. So to do this, we're going to use an oblivious transfer protocol. So the receiver will just input as its choice bit, either left or right, corresponding to which one it wants. And the sender, remember, doesn't know exactly where in the tree we were you know, transmitting these values. But instead, what it can do is just take the sum of all of the left children at the bottom of this tree, and then the sum of all the right children. And for the one which the receiver choose, chooses, we know that it will be able to compute all of the other children except for the one it's missing. So it can subtract these and get the right missing value to fill in in its tree. <coughs> And the nice thing about this, when we do use a puncturable PRF, instead of using function secret sharing or a distributed point function, is that if we look at this entire protocol for doing this across the whole tree, then all we're doing is a batch of OTs where at each OT, the receiver inputs a choice bit, which is just based on one bit of its input alpha. Meanwhile, the sender is inputting these um, sums of evaluations of the GGM tree, they can just compute all of these in parallel, and we can do all of these OTs in parallel in a single round of communication. Uh, if you compare this with a distributed point function, then the input to the OTs actually kind of change in each level, and you end up having to do things iteratively, obtaining a round complexity that scales with the depth of the tree. So if we plug this in to generate the seeds for the entire setup for silent OT, um, and for each of these punctual PRF trees, we need log n OTs. They can be done in parallel. So if we have a two-round OT protocol, we can do this setup in two rounds. And that's pretty much everything we need to get the seeds for silent OT. Um, so when, if T is the noise weight of the sparse error vector E, then essentially the dominant cost is just going to be T times log n of these OTs to set up the trees. Uh, one thing is if we're doing vector OLE, then we also need a small kind of seed vector OLE um, to do some multiplications, which we'll need as well. <clears throat> and interestingly, if we take silent OT and then we want to use this directly to build OT on chosen inputs, where the sender and receiver have their private inputs they want to, they want to do OT on, uh, and if we do this in parallel with the setup phase, we actually still get a two-round protocol. We don't increase the complexity. Uh, and that's essentially because in the first round, when the receiver sends its message, the choice bits for the OTs, then it, it already knows the noise positions um, for the LPN instance. So it knows the pseudo-random uh, pseudo random choice bits, which is it's, it's going to obtain for its random OTs, so it can already kind of use these to mask its input in the first round. 
and obtain chosen input OTs directly. So this gives us a two-round OT extension protocol, um, which actually compared with the IKNP protocol was not possible previously. Um, <clears throat> so there's actually some kind of black box impossibility result, which says that any um, OT extension protocol, which only uses, a, say, a symmetric primitives in a black box way, cannot have two rounds. And this is why IKMP has three rounds, also related to the fact that it has this transpose step, which flips the roles of the sender and receiver you have to account for. Um, so previously, the only approach to two-round OT extension was uh, an expensive garbled circuit Bates approach, uh, which relying on LPN here, we managed to avoid. Okay, so lastly, I want to talk a bit about active security. <clears throat> so just as before in my vector elite presentations, um, I'm gonna kind of follow this in the same kind of spirit by saying, okay, we want to design an active secure protocol. I think the first thing to look at is what can go wrong with an active adversary. So we have this setup protocol where all we're doing is OTs. Let's look at the receiver. Uh, if we have a malicious receiver, then Alice is just inputting to each OT one of these choice bits corresponding to one bit of this position alpha, which is an LPN noise coordinate. So if she inputs a different bit here, it's just changing the value of alpha. And that's basically only there to help her security. So by doing something different here, she's not actually breaking the protocol in any way. So the tricky part, as usual, is when we have the sender who is supposed to input these two messages, which are the sum of the leaves of the GGM tree. So if the sender just inputs one of these incorrectly, uh, then it can completely break the privacy of the protocol. Uh, you can end up with some garbage outputs of the PRF tree, um, PRF, PRF tree uh, which translate to incorrect OT outputs. So the natural thing to try to address this is to perform some kind of verification stage where we can actually check the consistency of this GGM tree after we've created it. But we're still gonna have the problem here that because we're using OT, then we allow selective failure attacks. So you know, if the sender inputs a message just into the sum of the left input for the OT, um, then this will only cause an error if Alice's choice bit was left. Um, so this kind of translates into the corrupt sender being allowed to try to guess a few bits of the secret LPN noise coordinates known to the receiver. And of course, it will only succeed if all of these guesses it tries to make actually succeed, and otherwise the protocol will abort. Um, we can actually model this kind of leakage as a kind of variant on LPN where we have um, we allow the adversary to make a very limited type of guess on the noise coordinates of the instance, um, which essentially translates into, on average, one bit of leakage on the noise coordinates. So in practice, that makes no difference. And you can always slightly increase the entropy or the parameters if you want to compensate for it. OK, so how can we check this consistency? Well, so let's go back to the leaves of the GGM tree. Uh, so on the right, the sender has all of the leaves. On the left, the receiver has the punctured key, so it has all but one. And to check correctness, we're actually going to go a step further and expand this tree to have twice as many leaves. Um, so by just applying another layer of POG evaluations, imagine this is now a, a tree which has um, depth one more, so twice as many leaves. And on this new layer of leaves, the receiver will have all of the outputs, so it's still just missing one overall. <clears throat> so now we're going to have the sender compute some check value. Um, to verify consistency of the tree by just taking a hash function and hashing together these new leaves we created. And now the receiver knows all of this second layer, um, so it can just receive the hash value and check that this gives the right thing. And it turns out that if this check passes, then we're actually guaranteed with high probability uh, that the original tree was chosen in a consistent way. Of course, the, the catch here is that at this point, we have to account for some leakage of the um, the position alpha known to the receiver, because if the sender did cheat, then it might have just guessed the right amount of information, 
to be able to come up with the right hash value, even though things didn't go quite as they were supposed to. But if you do that, then you can make this work out and prove that you can get a consistent tree. Uh, but this isn't quite enough for the entire silent OT protocol uh, because of one detail, which I kind of missed in the explanation before, which is that for each of these trees, we actually want to use this to multiply the sparse vector by this value delta. And we can incorporate this on the last level of the OTs we do by just having the sender send some extra value uh, to correct things. But the problem is they might use different deltas in different tree instances. And since the hash check is just checking a single tree at a time and it's independent of delta, this doesn't catch this issue. So solution here is, of course, another consistency check where we now take a random linear combination sampled by the receiver across all of the punctual PRF trees. And this is kind of seen as like a MAC check on the correlated OTs. Uh, it's also used in MPC protocols and zero-knowledge protocols. Uh, so it's a standard kind of technique. And if you have the hash-based consistency check as well, then this turns out to be enough to prove security of the overall protocol, uh, ensuring things are consistent. So this was an approach that uh, we took in the paper from CCS 2019. So since then, there's been a couple of follow-up works um, which have simplified these checks slightly. So in the Ferret and Wolverine papers, which do correlated OT and vector OLE respectively, um, they don't do the hash check on the trees. They actually do um, a linear combination on each tree uh, separately instead. And the way they can take the linear combination there actually means that they can also, also account for the deltas amongst the different trees and ensure that these things are consistent. Uh, so this check is a bit simpler. Uh, you don't need a hash function, so it's uh, cheaper in terms of computation. And you also don't need to expand these trees to an extra layer at the end. <clears throat> but again, it has the same kind of issue where, of course, the, the sender can always try to cheat and guess a few coordinates of the LPN error vector. OK, so what about performance? Um, so here's a table of most of the relevant protocols. Uh, firstly, the IKNP style protocols. Actually, this is like the most kind of optimized state of the art IKNP style OT extension, um, all with active security. And to generate 10 million random OTs, uh, with IKMP, you need this huge amount of communication uh, around 160 megabytes. Uh, you can do this in under half a second. Uh, it's pretty cheap. Whereas if we switch to silent OT extension, then the very first implementation we did, where we used the dual LPN instance instantiated with quasi-cyclic codes, drastically reduced the communication by more than a thousand times. Uh, the cost of some increase in computation up to around five seconds or so. Um, so this is a, a huge difference. This is kind of the most extreme trade-off. Um, there are different parameter settings where you can reduce computation a little and increase communication. Um, but if you use some of the different instances of LPN, then you can actually reduce the runtime much further. So the ferret paper took the primal approach, which in theory doesn't have such a great stretch, um, so should have much worse communication uh, but actually with some nice optimizations and this uh, kind of bootstrapping style approach where they use some of the output correlated OTs to reduce the cost of the setup for a next instance of the silent OT, uh, then you can reduce communication pretty good and still get it to, what, around half a megabyte after some extra one-time setup cost and reduce the runtimes by around a factor of 10. Whereas the silver approach uh, from last year, which took this structured LDBC instantiation of the dual code, um, then retains the same small communication as the previous dual approach, but reduces the runtimes further uh, down to just 300 milliseconds, which is actually even faster than the IKNP style OT extension. And that's kind of amazing that we can have this silent feature and get something computationally, at least in this in this specific case of a, a single core of a CPU, uh, faster than IKMP. And I think the main reason this is possible actually is if you go back to the basic structure of these protocols, 
In IKNP, we have this transpose step. And computing a matrix transpose is actually not such a cheap operation. Uh, it's not very cache friendly. It has to be done very carefully. And by doing these silent OT approaches, we don't do matrix transpose. And that's what allows you to shave off this extra, extra few milliseconds if you have a fast enough encoding with the dual approach. Okay, um, so that's about all I wanted to talk about for these protocols. Um, so let's sum up quickly. <clears throat> so I mostly talk about silent OT, but everything I said can be extended to build vector OLE with only fairly small changes. And um, so the main idea which I want to get across today is that exploiting this somewhat linear structure of LPN with these noise terms then we can expand things locally uh, to get silent protocols uh, by taking compressed sharings of sparse vectors and expanding them to longer pseudorandom outputs. And the key tool here is this punctual PRF, which is kind of a simpler form of function secret sharing. <clears throat> and then we have these setup protocols, which are very simple, only two rounds, can be made actively secure with lightweight consistency checks, and even be used to get a two round OT extension protocol on chosen inputs. <clears throat> so even though these protocols are really fast, um, I think there's still some open problems which could be interesting to address. Um, so one thing I haven't talked about but has been mentioned a few times at other talks in the school is um, many different applications of PCGs and silent OT. Um, so I think it's interesting to look at applications which can really take advantage more of these features. Um, so you know, it's such a massive change compared with regular IK, IKNP extension to silent OT in terms of the efficiency characteristics. Uh, maybe there are certain things if we design in the right way, then we can exploit this and make the best use of it possible. Um, another really interesting open question um, is to build this punchable pseudo-random function in a more efficient way. So, because we want to do this t times for each error point, um, each non-zero position in the error vector, and the naive way to do this involves this t factor repetition. Um, well, you can get around this using structure regular errors. It's nice to avoid that assumption. Um, this is also related to the question which Alette asked at the end of her talk about doing the same thing for distributed point functions. But of course, punctual PRFs are a simpler object. So I think it, you know, it's definitely easier to look at this case instead and see if there's something possible. <clears throat> and go to the setup protocol. So we have these two round protocols where the structure is Alice sends a message and then Bob sends a message depending on Alice's message. Uh, but for building random OT, it might actually be feasible to do something in just one round. So that would be the dream if we can do the setup phase where Alice and Bob both send a parallel message. And I don't know how to do this with the LPN-based constructions, but it would be really nice to achieve while still getting the uh, fast computation and efficiency benefits of silent OT. And then finally, I think a really big question, especially as these things are becoming so much faster and much more practical, is to closely investigate the security of these different variants of LPN. So while the primal version and the quasi-cyclic version, I think, are fairly well studied um, and may be reasonable to use in applications now, I think the more recent ones, like the structured LDPC used in Silver and Ring LPN used in other applications, as well as variable density LPN, which you've all talked about yesterday, um, these, they, they all seem plausible from the analysis that have been done, but in terms of the exact concrete security you get, I think there's a a lot that still needs to be understood and work that can be done. Okay, so that's about all I wanted to cover. I guess we have plenty of time for questions. Okay, so we have one question. Mm -hmm. so the question is, where is our punchable PRFs used? Uh, so where is it used? Mm -hmm. um, oh, where else or where in this protocol? Where else? Where else? Oh, okay, um, that's a good question. So they were actually first introduced um, back in what 2013-ish in the context of indistinguishability obfuscation. Um, so it's kind of very different application, but it turns out they're a really useful 
theoretical tool for making constructions work in a provable, secure way um, by using punctual PRFs inside obfuscated programs to generate values pseudo randomly. And that was like the really big one. Um, one of the much more practical application I can think of is I think forward security in TLS. Um, so there've been a bunch of papers recently on the last few years on yeah, forward secure um, key exchange, where they use puncturable encryption, which I think in some cases can be implemented with a puncturable PRF. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Peter, uh, for a great talk. We will resume after the lunch break for your second talk. Great. Thanks, everyone.